Mike Amesbury, you are 52. Yep. There's not that much about you online, actually. Um, so yeah. let's start at the beginning. What did your mum and dad do? Um, well, my mum was, unless she worked on the dinners, you know. No dinner lady. Dinner, dinner lady, yeah. Um, my dad was a carpet fitter. It was a company called Not Mill Carpet. So Manchester, kind of born in Wivenshaw, and then ended up over the, the Castleford area, West Yorkshire, perhaps yeah. you'll be familiar with. Um, um, eventually become publicans. So literally did grow up part of my life in a pub. What's, what, what age were you when you moved into the pub? Um, I think it was around 15. Oh my gosh, like so that, you yeah. started to get interested in alcohol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So was it fun? It. it was, it was. It was, um, I mean, a bit like, you know, in terms of being a member of parliament, lots of people, if you live in the community, which I do, everyone wants a slice of your nose. It's a bit like that, being a publican's son and my mum and dad really you know the regulars become friends of the family yeah yeah, yeah. So. and you joined the Labour Party when you were 17 17 yes were your parents members of the Labour Party or uh, no my dad was um my dad was a shop steward in the past um it was a glass factory he worked in at some stage um um so he was certainly interested in politics and it was a Labour area and I saw a lot of work that the local Labour Party did in terms of the miners' strike. You know? So I'm not saying they necessarily always got it right, but, but, but yes. So it's closest to my, my political beliefs, really. And so the miners' strike, 84, 85, trying to do my maths. Yes. I mean, you're still young. Yes. But you, but you were political and you remember images from that strike and it was the biggest industrial dispute of our I do. generation, wasn't it? Yes. And of course, a lot of our customers in the pub were miners, you know, and they were um, out for a year with very little money other than, other than charity and mutual aid, really. So, you know, and it, it affected other businesses. And, mm. um, and of course, they were our customers beyond the strike as well. So, yeah. Were you the first in, the, in your family to go to university? I was. I was, yeah, so mightily proud of that. I didn't do particularly well at school. So I left school, um, 1985 was a key, key, key date in my life, isn't it really? Um, and um, there wasn't much in the way of work. So I had spells of unemployment and, and, and manual jobs really. Um, um, so I'd had long spells of, of youth unemployment really. Eventually I decided to go into further education and I did uh, a BTEC which the current government obviously are controversially getting rid of. Um, um, and then I ended up going to what's called Ilkley College. So it was a- I went to Bradford College, which because it was Bradford yes. and Ilkley Community College yes. I went to so the Bradford So again, you, you, you're familiar with. And, and I did, I got a, I got a degree. Um, I got involved with student politics as well. I was, I was president of the student union at Wakefield and then I was president of the union at Ilkley and then you know, labour politics, union politics, you name it. Once you went back into further education, did you think I'm going to go university, that, that's for me, that's where this is going to end up when you started doing your BTEC? No, um, I'd say it was my, uh, my granddad, Granddad Ted, that um, inspired me. You know, he was uh, uh, many years of a chief technician in the RAF, amongst other things, working on the, uh, the Vulcan bombers, the old nuclear deterrent. So... Um, and, and he encouraged me to go all, all the way. And that, that really helped, because I always felt that, you know, it wasn't for people like me, um, university, higher education. Um, so, so no, I, I went for it. And you said that you had a number of manual jobs. What was the toughest? Um, I mean, I've done all kinds of things, really. I, I once uh, worked at a, a, a bookbinders and used to laminate, I mean, 100 books a day, and that was quite, Gosh. it was production line stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, they once called me a trainee sign engineer, and that was putting up signs on quite large, large buildings, such as uh, post offices and everything else. There was no training, I just ended up, you'd end up doing it, going up rope ladders in some quite windy weather and things at the time. So that, that was, a, was a tough one. I worked at Manchester Airport on stage as well, so um, went kind of back to the home turf with Inshore, um, um, a company called Service Air, and that was just in a bonded warehouse, filling up the trolleys that go up and down the planes. 
um, um, when people are enjoying themselves with a duty free. So you have definitely had normal jobs, what people could call normal <laughs> jobs, which makes you something of a rarity in Parliament. Of course, there are, there are some, yes. but it's not the majority anymore. No, no, it's not. Um, and, and that's something that needs to happen, doesn't it? Um, um, right across the piece, really. Um, we've certainly got more women in Parliament, um, which is massive progress, progress that needs to, needs to continue. But in terms of social class, and class is still alive and kicking. I mean, you know, sitting on those green benches for the first time and listening to that strange language and those strange customs and practices, you can't even speak human, you know, I can't say you, no. as you well know. You've got to say the honourable. The honourable, the right honourable, the gallant, and you pulled up on it. Um, um, but obviously uh, you get on top of the strange and quirky customs and practices. Hopefully at some stage it'll change, but it's slow, isn't it? That yeah. place is slow to change. What would your message be to young working class people who think oh, they could never be a member of parliament, but it, it, it would improve our, our politics, wouldn't it? It would. And go for it. Um, I mean, one of the few things probably American politics gets right, you know, where they talk about look, and anybody could be the president of the United States can aspire to you know the very the very top here there are considerable barriers in the way deliberately put in our way well kick those barriers down kick those walls down that's the important thing that people have got to do from you know when working class backgrounds do you ever feel intimidated by all the posh people in parliament do i ever feel intimidated by all the posh the many posh people in parliament um I I think you kind of brought up that way and then you realise, well, you might talk posh, you might sound clever, but listen to the detail. And then you, you quickly realise <laughs> that that's, that's not the case. Despite all that money spent on very expensive education, then, you know, right from the very top, yes, it quickly dispels that myth. Um, now... I didn't know this about you when I was um, doing my research. So you worked as a, an advisor for Angela Rayner before you got elected to Parliament. I did. Was that before she was famous, as it were? Yes, <laughs> yes. Go on, tell us what she was like then, really. Um, I mean, what you see is what you get, quite genuinely. Um, a real character. Um, I helped Angela, Angie, with her selection. Uh, she spoke to me, said, look, will you work for me? I'd always said no. A number of MPs in the past, I'm not naming names, but I'd said, will you work? I'd always said no. I couldn't think of anything worse. The ego and everything else that, that comes speaking now, hopefully. <laughs> I'm a different example. But Angie was very different. You know, um, a working class woman um, um, that's quite fiery. It's incredibly bright, incredibly bright. Um, um, she's ever in the Labour Party is about, isn't she, really, in terms of social mobility? And obviously, I relate to aspects of the background and the backstory. So, so yeah, I worked for her uh, for a couple of years. Left on good terms. She's still a good friend of mine. <laughs> Do you think we'll ever see Prime Minister Angela Rayner? Um, I mean, I, I, obviously, we've got Keir Starmer as the leader at the moment. And uh, uh, I want to see Keir Starmer as the Prime Minister. Um so you were elected in 2017. Obviously, it's such a proud moment. I remember that moment. It's not just proud, pride for yourself and yes. an honour for yourself, but it means a great deal to one's parents. Yes. But you lost your mum shortly before that 2017 election. Yes, I did. So um, my mum, um, unfortunately, I mean, she was a great fighter and that's where I get some of the fighting spirit from. She always encouraged me. Um, she fought off breast cancer um, and unfortunately got secondary cancer, um, a brain tumour. Um, yes. And, uh, um, and obviously didn't win that fight. Um, so, but my, uh, I was very proud my dad could come um, and see me in Parliament. Um, and... Uh, he had mass for me, for my mother, so father Pat. So um, around that period when I was elected, so 
So, you know, she was there, there in spirit, yes. It's obviously a really tough thing to do and sometimes people get emotional during these interviews and that helps to humanise politicians and... But I can see you've you've reined it back now, so let's get back to politics. Yes, yes. Yeah, to, to yes. politics. Um, you have been in opposition for since you got elected, obviously, in 2017. Yes. But actually, you've changed the law, yes. which is not something that I could have ever said, and I had nine and a half years there. Yes. Um, there's very few MPs can have claimed to change the law, but you changed the law on the cost of school uniforms. Yes. First of all, why was that important to you? And secondly, give MPs some tips on how you can change the law in opposition as, I don't know if you're a backbench MP or, but, but you certainly want in the cabinet, in the shadow cabinet. Yes, yes. Um, there's so many um, children and families and parents, carers, grandparents are struggling. Even before we had the COVID, pan COVID pandemic, and now what we're calling the cost of living crisis, um, just to make ends meet. And the astronomical cost of school uniforms, and I was lobbied quite hard. Just experiences you have, you know, your own community with your friends and family and constituents. And then nationally as well, so the likes of um, the National Children's Society um, um, uh, and others, you know, had said, look, this is a cause that's not got across the line, even though successive governments have spoke about, you know, bringing down the cost of school uniforms. Um, statutory guidance as it was it says right well i'll be the person uh, i'll come out number one you have this lottery don't you yeah. this can't be bizarre again another bizarre thing about, <laughs> about, about parliament and then the phone didn't stop running the emails and everything else you know you think you'd won the lottery in a way you have in terms of you know a real chance to to change the law but then of course um the government's got an 80 seat majority so you've got to build coalitions and convince people that it's the right cause. And remind people what they've said very publicly, you know, previous Secretary of State of Education. It was something in our manifesto as well, the Labour, Labour manifesto. Um, and in all fairness to the likes of Nick Gibbs, I'd say in particular, the schools minister, I've never sent, spent so much time in the government whip's office, by the, by the way. Building those coalitions and then getting it through every stage of parliament, which you're right, is, is a challenge. In the midst of a national international health pandemic, by the way. So we had the COVID bumps in the road. Um, but we got there. We got there. Um, one of the biggest drivers, of course, were, were the parents and actually the children themselves. So the amount of emails and they bombarded various people, including the um, um, Jacob Reeves, Reeves mob and his role as leader of the house, when we thought we were going to, things were going to be timed out. But we got there. And what does, what, what law did you change? Tell us what practical effect. Yes, so the, it, it will, uh, it's statutory guidance around school uniforms, putting cost centre stage. So it will ensure that um, affordability is something that head teachers, school governors, um, um, must build into the DNA of any kind of uniform policy going going forward. It'll also open up competition, which is important because you will know that um, from your own previous experience, you have that strange arrangement where there's one manufacturer and one provider, and they've done some kind of a bit of historical deal with the with the school. Mm. So that will bring costs down, and it'll also celebrate good practice where schools, you know, say look, actually. Minimise the branded items and then go to could be the local supermarket exactly. for various items. Yeah. Um, swap shops as well. So that will that's a part of the legislation going forward to so encourage that good practice. But very importantly, has the law behind parents and carers and grandparents now. So if it's too expensive, and you know, um, listeners, uh, viewers, we're very familiar with branded items, caps, scarves ties, socks, even masks recently in the pandemic. It's not on. It's not acceptable. It's pricing out working class children. And what do you do if you're a parent that thinks, hang on a minute, this is a racket, this. What should you do? Contact your MP? Because the yeah. law's on your side, that's what you're saying. Well, well as, 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 a, as a result of that, that law, yeah, you can go through, you, initially you go through the normal channels, that'd be the head teacher of the governors, but you can go right to the Secretary of State, you know. Um, Lots of schools are positively responding to this and going forward, 
you know, changing their school uniform policies. There's some great ones out there already. There's some terrible ones as well. So it's dealing with those terrible ones. Mike Amesbury. I'm sure lots of parents will be grateful for that change in the law. And I'm sure your mum, I'm sure is with you in spirit, would be very proud of you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you.